Hello, and welcome to Young Heretics, the worst hookup ever edition. Today on Young Heretics, we are resuming our two-part series on T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Last week, we did the first half of this series, and now we are finishing up this, I think, really deep and incredible poem by T.S. Eliot, The Great Modernist, a lyric poem. If you did not see that first episode, go ahead and take a look at it, go back and watch it, but it's not necessary to follow along with this episode because we are going to recap just sort of the major points and what this work is before we get into kind of how it all works and, and why it's great. So just to briefly go back over who Elliot is, why we care about him, what's the deal. Elliot was an American expatriate he lived most of his professional life in England, in the UK, although he was born in the US. Suffered from a lot of congenital disorders as a kid, was kind of a sickly child, and grew up eventually to become a scholar, a scholar especially of philosophy and Sanskrit literature, which we'll get into a little bit on this episode. He famously converted to Christianity, and that's one of the things that we've been tracing across this two-part series, because The Wasteland is really, of all of his works, it is his great work, sort of pre-conversion to Anglican Christianity. He was born into a Unitarian family, but The Wasteland is really takes place or, or is written from a kind of bleaker, more, you might even say godless perspective, although we'll, we'll get into just how true that is as we discuss this text. But we are tracing in this two-part series the part of Eliot's career that really emerged from his sort of pre-conversion state. And it was after his conversion that he wrote another great work, which we will work on and think about later on, Four Quartets. And we're going to do another two-part series on Four Quartets. And the reason that we're doing it this way is that T.S. Eliot offers us an opportunity to kind of watch somebody moving in, you might say in real time, but in, in public and as a, as a literary thinker from life before faith to life after faith. And he does so in a way that is, I think, really searingly honest at every stage. He is never giving you BS. That's kind of what I've been arguing is great about Eliot throughout these two episodes on The Wasteland and what I think we sort of need to sit with, especially on a show like this, which is about celebrating and delighting in kind of richness and joy of the Western canon and the Western tradition. It's important to kind of acknowledge that there is also a lot of despair in the Western tradition generally, and especially in the modern and postmodern parts of the Western tradition, which is really where we are. We can't just pretend that this isn't happening because we're in it right now. We're seeing all around us the effects of people falling into despair, people losing their way in the West, the great leaders of the West even sort of having little to no sense of why they're here, what they're doing. And Eliot documents all of that. He experienced it himself in the kind of desolation of his unhappy marriage, in the difficulties with his health. He wrote this poem from a kind of convalescent, a series of convalescent retreats. So he he himself was kind of entering into the malaise and just the, the ennui, and I'm using a bunch of French words because the French have all these great words for just this sense of, of boredom and, and emptiness and listlessness, which pervades this poem and which was, which was a big part of Eliot's life, maybe the dominating feature of Eliot's life as he was writing this poem. But we also talked in the previous episode about the way in which it, what Eliot said was, a great poet in writing himself writes his time. And we've been talking about kind of the way in which Eliot's own unique, subjective, personal experience of the world of the UK between the wars. That personal experience also captured and communicated something much broader and, and in fact, much, much deeper as well about what was going on in the West generally in this period sort of after a cataclysmic war, this, this sort of unprecedented and unexpected and strange and terrible gutting of all of Europe's best men, this bloodbath and this carnage. What you kind of think of when you think of that 
moment in history as you think of the intense destruction that the war wrought across the European countryside and in in the West more generally. But what you don't think so much about is what Eliot captures the sort of period after that of just everything feeling sort of drab and, and leached of meaning. And so I said in the previous episode that this is going to be the most depressing episode of Young Heretics. Now that we're into this second episode, I, we, we started last time to sort of talk about whether there are seeds of hope in this poem, and we're going to go more deeply into that in this episode, just sort of ask to what extent it is honest to draw any seeds of the hope that Eliot would later experience. Because remember, he later converted to Christianity. But in this poem, you know, he he is just kind of expressing the emptiness. And the question is, you know, can we find anywhere these, these little inklings of hope? Because if we can find inklings of hope in, in Eliot and in the wasteland, then perhaps we ourselves can also find some kind of hope, right? In this moment where we feel as if maybe the West is directionless, America kind of doesn't know what it's about. There are these riots in the streets, right? Everything is, everything just seems to be falling apart. Yeah. And, and that's the reason why I've chosen to spend so much time on Eliot on this show is because I think if we can grapple honestly with what Eliot's doing in the wasteland, and if we can still come out of that with some non kind of smiley faced, but still realistic sense of joy and sense of hope, uh, then we'll really be getting somewhere. Then we'll be getting beyond just the kind of happy talk, pretending like the world outside doesn't exist. We'll, we'll really be getting into, you know, how can you capture everything that is wrong and see full on, see eye to eye everything that is wrong and still maintain some sense that the West will endure, that the West is great. So, we started out, we kind of explored the ways in which Eliot, in the first two sections of this poem, there are five parts to this long lyric poem, Eliot gathers together all of these scraps from earlier literature. And he's portraying this London scene of just kind of hope falling out of the world. And, and, and of course, we begin with this, this famous line, right? April is the cruelest month, which sort of tells us, you know, it's even worse that sometimes in spring, we hope for the return of love, but that hope is always dashed. And there's just this constant sense of emptiness. And one of the most famous lines, I had not thought death had undone so many. That was the first two sections of this poem. And now we're going to jump into the third section and I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing, which is to kind of just take focus on a few key references, a few key allusions within the poem and explain them and explain why they fill out the poem and why, why this kind of modernist style of just grabbing a bunch of different scraps from around the literary tradition, why this modernist style is, is right for expressing what Eliot is trying to express here. So we leap into section three of the poem, which in his own notes, Eliot called this the substance, the, the sort of event that occurs in this poem is the sort of the substance of the poem. And that doesn't mean that it's the only important thing, but it does mean that there's something, obviously it's central, right? And if in a five-part poem, if, if part three is at the center, then there's something kind of crucial here. And it's called the Fire Sermon, which we're going to get into. That's a, a reference to Buddhist scripture, to a set of Buddhist scriptures called the Pali Canon. And I'm going to get a little bit into sort of what that is and why it was important to Eliot in a moment. But first, we have actually something from a totally different tradition, something much more at home on this show about the West, which is the Greek tradition, right? The speaker of this part of the poem, the sort of person watching everything happen, is Tiresias. And you probably, if you know a little bit about Greek stuff, you might know who Tiresias is, or you might not. You might not have ever heard of him. I'm going to just briefly sort of say who Tiresias is. He, he was probably the most famous prophet and seer of the ancient Greek world. There were others. There was Calchas. We've talked a little bit about the, the Cumaean Sibyl. We've talked about, you know, all this, tr this tradition of people who kind of see into the future because they've been they've been blessed and cursed by the gods both at once, right? This poem itself begins with an epigraph about the Cumaean Sibyl. We eventually, I'm sure, will talk at some point about Cassandra, the Trojan prophetess, whom no one would listen to. That was her curse. And so prophets in the Greek tradition generally tend to be touched by the gods and gifted, but also therefore, for that same reason, cursed with something like seeing too much or, or experiencing too much, knowing too much. And so this poem is, is narrated by Tiresias. And before I get into the, the poem itself, 
I am just going to read to you a little section. This uh, Oh, I mentioned in the previous episode that I'm working here with the Norton Critical Edition, which is really awesome because it has all of the these sort of big sections. After the poem, it gives you a bunch of excerpts from literature which Eliot is using, to which Eliot is referring throughout this poem. And so one of the things it, it has in here is a section from Ovid's Metamorphosis. And Ovid was a, an epic poet during the Augustan period in Rome. So Augustus, the sort of heir to Julius Caesar, uh, was the first official emperor of Rome. And it was during this period that a lot actually of Rome's most sort of monumental epic poetry was written. We don't have time to kind of wander down that rabbit hole, but we certainly will in a future episode. You know, this, this moment in Roman history of sort of great political upheaval in the sense that the Republic was had collapsed and was turning now into an empire, but also tremendous artistic fertility. And Ovid was a kind of complicated figure in the, in the sort of in that era of Roman history. But anyway, he writes The Metamorphosis, which is a big, sprawling, epic poem about, well, about a number of things. It's sort of a compendium of different myths all stitched together to tell one big history of the universe. And it's called The Metamorphosis because it focuses on transformation. It focuses on myths in which people get turned into stuff. So, you know, nymphs getting turned into trees or people getting turned into stags and all this, all these different things. So this is the story of the blinding of Tiresias from Ovid's Metamorphoses. It's from a translation by Frank Justice Miller. Now, while these things were happening on the earth by the decrees of fate, when the cradle of Bacchus, twice born, was safe, it chanced that Jove, the story goes, while warmed with wine, so Jove now is the king of the Greek gods, right? Jove, while warmed with wine, put care aside and bandied good-humored jests with Juno. This is his wife. These are the Roman names of the Greek gods, right? Juno in an idle hour. I maintain, said Jove, that your pleasure in love is greater than that which we enjoy. She held the opposite view. And so they decided to ask the judgment of wise Tiresias. He knew both sides of love. For once, with a blow of his staff, he had outraged two huge serpents mating in the green forest. And, wonderful to relate, from man he was changed into a woman, and in that form spent seven years. In the eighth year, he saw the same serpents again and said, Since in striking you there is such magic power as to change the nature of the giver of the blow, now will I strike you once again. So saying, he struck the serpents, and his former state was restored, and he became as he had been born, turned back into a man. He therefore, being asked to arbitrate the playful dispute of the gods, took sides with Jove. Saturnia, they say, that's another name for Juno, grieved more deeply than she should and than the issue warranted and condemned the arbitrator to perpetual blindness. But the Almighty Father, that's again, that's Jove, for no god may undo what another god has done, in return for his loss of sight, gave Tiresias the power to know the future, lightening the penalty by the honor. So there are a number of Greek myths that are like this, where some mortal will incur the wrath of the gods and be punished in some way and then be compensated with some other gift. And often that gift is prophecy. So as I said before, prophecy is kind of this thing that is, that is associated both with great honor, but also with, this, with a terrible curse, in this case, blindness. I kind of skipped over, but I want to go back now and mention both because it's crazy and because it's important for Eliot, the fact that Tiresias spent seven years as a woman, right? <laughs> he had this moment, this kind of weird myth that Ovid mentions in passing. Ovid is very good at this. He's kind of wry and, and, and urbane and sophisticated. He just tosses these little scraps out here. Oh yeah, Tiresias at one point turned into a woman. And that's why he's sort of the right person to judge this competition between Jove and Juno or Zeus and Hera, you to use the Greek names, right? He's, he's there as a way of arbitrating a question about who has more pleasure in sex, which if you thought that was a modern question, it is not. It is a very ancient question, right? Do men or women enjoy sex more? Jove and Juno have this argument about it and they go to Tiresias and classic, Tiresias tells them the truth uh, or the truth as he sees it or gives him an answer. And Juno is so mad that she turns him blind. And then, you know, that's where he gets his, his gift of prophecy. So this is the, the being that we are dealing with. He's a stock character in a lot of Greek myths. He comes up in a ton of tragedies. He kind of stands as this almost timeless representative 
of the place of visionaries in human life, that the what it's like to stand in such a relation to the gods or to the divine that you're able to have some special access to it, which both makes you great and makes you sort of a pariah or broken in in some way. And so Tiresias is this kind of slightly androgynous or combining man and woman within him. He's this, this weird figure who is blind, but also a seer. All of that having been said, let us jump into the part of this poem, The Wasteland, which Tiresias narrates. Eliot has Tiresias narrate a, a sort of the crucial section, and we will shortly get into why that might be, why it might be that Tiresias is the person to narrate this. But here we are. I'm starting at line 218. If you are following along, I'm going to read a chunk of section three of The Wasteland, The Fire Sermon. I, Tiresias, though blind, throbbing between two lives, old man with wrinkled female breasts, can see at the violet hour, the evening hour that strives homeward and brings the sailor home from sea. The typist home at tea time, clears her breakfast, lights her stove, and lays out food in tins. Out of the window perilously spread her drying combinations touched by the sun's last rays. On the divan are piled, at night her bed, stockings, slippers, camisoles, and stays. I, Tiresias, old man with wrinkled dugs, perceived the scene and foretold the rest. I, too, awaited the expected guest. This is a heartbreaking passage to me, and I'm going to try and get across a little bit of why I find it so heartbreaking. In the previous episode, near the end, I spent a little bit of time talking about one of the ways that Eliot's classical references and his references to kind of great English poetry as well, the way those references help to frame his despair about modernity. So you have these small, sad, empty little lives against this huge dramatic backdrop. And in section two, we had this, this kind of gaudy woman uh, compared with Cleopatra, the queen, the queen of the Nile, right? The, 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 face that transformed a, a republic into an empire, this, this, this transcendent vision of womanhood held up against this kind of tawdry modern life. And this, this sickly feeling that Eliot conveys to us that I think some of us probably have too, this sickly feeling that we are supposed to be something great, that, that being a man or being a woman is this infinitely transcendent and majestic thing to be, but our lives just don't match up to that. And here we have Tiresias, who is this mystic figure, right? This figure of almost of infinite empathy, right? Because he, you know, in, in this version of it, Eliot has him be both man and woman at the same time, right? Old man with wrinkled dugs, with wrinkled breasts. And he is this kind of both decrepit, but also honorable and and majestic, strange, mysterious figure in the background of just the most heartbreakingly sort of bland scene, a typist, a young woman home from work in this little apartment where her couch doubles as her bed, right? This little flat. And we have to think here about, you know, at, at this period in the 1920s between the wars, at this period, a lot of the stuff that we now know well, a lot of the problems that we know well now were very new back then, right? These days, we, we know what it's like to scroll through Tinder or through whatever, you know, dating app and just kind of be, just feel like there's just this vast wasteland of emptiness out there. We know that feeling so well, but that's, you know, that hasn't always been the way that relationships between the sexes were. You know, the, the, this, the reason that we feel this tremendous sense of angst about how empty a lot of our romantic lives 
are or how empty the search for romantic love can be is because we've had all of these social structures kind of taken away from us. And a lot of that was happening and had just happened when Eliot was writing. You know, late 1800s, early 1900s, women were entering the workforce in unprecedented numbers. There's a million different reasons for that. The Industrial Revolution, the sort of gutting of the male workforce by the war, all of this stuff is creating this, this radically new situation in which women find themselves alone in cities and the sort of smallness and the sadness and the, the, the fear of that, having nothing to do, by the way, with any kind of feminist or anti-feminist statement, just this sense that you, you know, you grew up surrounded in this home with this family structure, and now suddenly you're out in this massive drab empty city and you, the this young woman, this type is just not prepared for how bleak it is out there. You know, I mean, there, there's another passage actually from a different book, The Devil in the White City, which is about, well, it's about a lot of things, but it's about Chicago in the 1890s and thereabouts. And there is this passage here that kind of gets at what I'm, what I'm describing here about what it was like for young women in this newly industrializing city. It's by Eric Larson. How easy it was to disappear. A thousand trains a day entered or left Chicago. Many of these trains brought single young women who had never even seen a city, but now hoped to make one of the biggest and toughest their home. Never before, this is a quote from Jane Addams, the urban reformer, never before in civilization have such numbers of young girls been suddenly released from the protection of the home and permitted to walk unattended upon the city streets and to work under alien roofs. So that is exactly, I think, the, the sense that contributes to what's going on in this typist's life. That's kind of what Tiresias is seeing. And the fact that it's Tiresias seeing it, who has seen, you know, gods and men clash and has seen just these, these sort of titanic episodes in the history of human life, that fact makes it even more pitiful and poignant. All this is sort of even more pitiful and, and sad and small in, in light of that. And, you know, we talked again, in the previous episode about whether there's hope in that. You know, there, there is this sense that if we, have, if we feel as if we were meant to be something more, if we were meant to be doing more than sitting in this little apartment with our clothes laid out on our couch, if we were meant to be doing more than scrolling through Tinder and swiping through a million different, you know, empty, meaningless dates, then maybe we can, we can sense our way back to that. If we have this intuition that Tiresias is watching us, right? That Cleopatra stands behind us. There's something, there's some hope for rebirth in that. And by the way, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm kind of shoving hope onto Eliot. I'm not suggesting that, or even making any claims about whether he felt hopeful or was writing, you know, with, with an intention to inspire hope in us. I'm looking for the most honest way ourselves to read this poem and think about how to move forward from it. So I hope that's clear. I'm not arguing that this is a hopeful poem. It's not. It's a despairing poem. But I want to see the despair as clearly as possible before trying to see what we can draw from it that we can move forward with. So the, the last line is probably the most pitiful part, right? Because what does Tiresias do? The last line that I read from that section is probably the most pitiful part, right? Because what does Tiresias do? He foretells the future. And what does he foretell? So he, he, he sees her coming home. He says, I, Tiresias, old man with wrinkled dugs, perceived the scene and foretold the rest. I too awaited the expected guest. So you probably are... are guessing where I'm going with this, but let me just read the next several lines and I will, we'll, we'll get into this. So he's watching this typist come home and he goes on starting right at two, line 231. He, the young man carbuncular, arrives, a small house agent's clerk with one bold stare, one of the low on whom assurance sits as a silk hat on a Bradford millionaire. The time is now propitious, as he guesses. The meal is ended, she is bored and tired, endeavors to engage her in caresses, which are still unreproved, if undesired. Flushed and decided, he assaults at once. Exploring hands encounter no defense. His vanity requires no response, and makes a welcome of indifference. And I, Tiresias, have foresuffered all, enacted on this same divan or bed, 
I who have sat by Thebes below the wall and walked among the lowest of the dead, bestows one final patronizing kiss and gropes his way, finding the stairs unlit. She turns and looks a moment in the glass, hardly aware of her departed lover. Her brain allows one half-formed thought to pass. Well, now that's done, and I'm glad it's over. When lovely woman stoops to folly and paces about her room again alone, she smooths her hair with automatic hand and puts a record on the gramophone. So there's, you know, it's one of those famous passages in all of English poetry. There's sort of a, you know, there's a tremendously comedic element to it, right? This, you know, I, Tiresias, who have walked among the lowest of the dead, am now expending my grand prophesying energies on watching this, like, really, really bad hookup, right? I said at the beginning this was going to be the worst hookup ever edition of Young Heretics. That's what it is. This is just a really empty, soulless, sad one-night stand. And it's not it's unreproved if undesired, right? This poor typist is just kind of, you know, she, well, I'm glad it's over. It's done. I'm glad it's over. And the kind of the most, perhaps the most famous way in which Eliot kind of compares the high and the low, right? Makes us aware of how miserable this is by, by bringing in some, some high form of poetry or art from the past is that line, when lovely woman stoops to folly, which is actually a quote. So here's the, the big reference that I want to kind of explore a little bit. This is a quote from a poem, the first line of a poem by Oliver Goldsmith from the 1700s. And the poem in full is very short. It goes like this. When lovely woman stoops to folly and finds too late that men betray, what charm can soothe her melancholy? What art can wash her tears away? The only art her guilt to cover, to hide her shame from every eye, to give repentance to her lover and wring his bosom is to die. So also a tragic poem, right? Also a, a sad and, and devastating vision of love gone wrong, just like this section of the fire sermon, section three of the wasteland, but tragic in an entirely different way, right? Tragic in the sense that it takes place in a context of strong social norms, right? This, this sense that, you know, when, when a lovely woman stoops to folly, when she gives herself away too soon, when she uh, betrays her virginity over to some just kind of meaningless cad, and he betrays her, she finds that out too late. What can she do but die, right? I mean, there are a million different stories from the great sort of epics and traditions of the West in which this, this happens. And look, of course, there are problems and excesses with a, with a world in which a woman can do nothing except to die when she has been, when she has sort of dishonored herself in this way. It's not to suggest that, oh, wasn't it great back in the day when, you know, women had to kill themselves if they, if they stooped to folly. It's not, I think, what Eliot is doing. It's not what I want to say at all. But what I do want to say is that the, the tragedy of that is a tragedy of meaning. It's a tragedy where everybody in the story understands what's expected of them and is, in some sense, living as the hero of his or her own story, even if it's the tragic hero, right? The tragedy of, of this part three, this kind of core part of the wasteland, of the fire sermon, that tragedy is a tragedy of smallness and directionlessness. And that's the modern tragedy, right? The modern, the modern malaise, the modern angst is this sense of just being kind of, you're living in a, an epic poem. And by the way, Eliot switches here to the iambic pentameter that's sort of associated with English heroic poetry. So we're in, we're living in this epic poem, but our lives are just so small. You know, they've been kind of sucked, had all the meaning sucked out of them by the advent of the modern era. And again, you know, this is, there, there's a backdrop here of all of this high classicism held up against just kind of the, the saddest, emptiest kind of life. All right, that's the, that's the pits of, of where this poem can go, I think. I don't think this poem can go any lower into depression and despair than that. And so now I would like to take some time and think about how we can kind of, how the poem itself points us toward a way out and how we, through reading the poem, can kind of think about ourselves in this world, even if we too feel kind of tawdry and small held up against the greatness of the Western tradition. So 
What's in the, the, the title of this section? The fire sermon is, it's kind of like the Sermon on the Mount for Buddhism. So obviously, you know, Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount and that becomes a central feature of all kind of Christian theology and ethics. Fire sermon is, is similar, you know, like Jesus, the, the historical Buddha never wrote anything down. So his followers compiled a bunch of stuff. We have this, this canon, the Pali canon, where a lot of what his followers sort of wrote about him exist. And so this fire sermon is part of that, and it's it's compiled by the Buddha's followers, and it's one of the central texts and teachings of the Buddhist tradition. Now, remember that, that Eliot, you know, studied Sanskrit and, and Buddhism and Hinduism. He's very interested in a number of sort of Eastern religions, and so he, he's kind of giving us this framework for kind of referring outward to the, the Buddha's fire sermon. And what is it? Well, I'm just going to read to you this, this small passage from it. Um, I, I mentioned on the previous episode that if you are into getting to know more about this poem, if you want to know more about this poem, this Connell Guide by Seamus Perry is actually really helpful. So, okay, the fire, this little section from the fire sermon of the Buddha. All things, O priests, are on fire. The eye, O priests, is on fire. Forms are on fire. Eye consciousness is on fire. Impressions received by the eye are on fire. And whatever sensation, pleasant, unpleasant, or indifferent, originates in dependence on impressions received by the eye that also is on fire. So this notion of being on fire, which is a little perplexing to us at first, actually isn't that foreign. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, that the eye is the light of the body. And if the eye is dark, how great is that darkness? That, that without, if, if the way that you perceive the world has gone out of whack, then, you know, the whole world basically seems out of whack because the whole world is filtered through your perception. This is a slightly different notion here in the fire sermon, which is that there is no way out of that in this sort of human plane of perception. The eye is on fire, that everything is kind of just distorted through our passions and through our, our attachment to the world, right? This is a big part of, of Theravada Buddhism is that attachment is the root of suffering. And I think one element of, you know, why Eliot is, is titling his, this section of the poem after that sermon, one, one reason why he has that Buddhist sermon in mind is that he has this sense of, of being unable to escape both from the kind of epic tradition in which he situates himself and the, the, the great literary tradition of, of English lyric poetry in which he situates himself in this poem, but also from his own and our own kind of emptiness and smallness. And I think that the, you know, for him, one key, and this is even true after he becomes a Christian in the four quartets, one key for Eliot is to find some way of stepping outside of your own kind of present experience. I've done a lot of talking on this podcast already about how important and valuable the, the subjective experience of the, of the world as you see it is. And I don't want to take away from that. But Eliot is also saying at the same time, in order to attain wisdom, in order to kind of gain perspective on that experience, especially if you are in despair, you must find some way of detaching and stepping back and seeing the bigger picture. And, and, and brilliantly, brilliantly, the wasteland is, is almost doing that in its very self, because by reading it, right, we don't just see the typist. We don't just live in the typist's world, although we do encounter all of the kind of emptiness and sadness and melancholy of that world. But we also see the frame, right? We see the context and the frame in which it's happening. And that frame is a, is a frame of, of Western literature and the, and the Western tradition more generally. Now, that frame at the moment prompts only despair in Eliot, right? But the question is, will it only ever prompt despair? Or by stepping back and looking at it, can we gain some hope about what will come in the future? I believe that the last two sections of this poem do give us hope that we will not always fall so tremendously short of our literary and cultural heritage. I am going to make that case starting by reading from section four of The Wasteland, which is the shortest section so I can read the whole thing. Before I read it, let me just say thank you so much, as I often say, for listening to this podcast or watching it. If you are watching it, really means a tremendous amount to me that each one of you is here. 
I am grateful for you guys. This, this show has been such a joy to do. And, you know, if you haven't already, please do subscribe. It will help you to get new episodes. And, you know, obviously it will help the show as well. What really helps the show is if you want to give us a five-star review on iTunes. That's tremendously helpful. So please do go away and do that. But most of all, just subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, because that way you will know whenever we put out new episodes. Okay. Back to The Wasteland and to section four of The Wasteland. By the way, this is another work that we are just going to have to return to again and again because there's so much more here that we're not talking about. But that's okay. I mean, one of the great joys of this show and being able to do it weekly is that we can return to stuff. We're going to return to a lot of things that we've already visited. So let me now read from section four of The Wasteland. And I'm going to read again the whole thing. And it starts on line 312. It's called Death by Water. Phlebas the Phoenician, a fortnight dead, forgot the cry of gulls and the deep sea swell and the profit and loss. A current under sea picked his bones in whispers. As he rose and fell, he passed the stages of his age and youth, entering the whirlpool. Gentile or Jew, O oh, you who turn the wheel and look to windward, consider Phlebas, who was once handsome and tall as you. That's the whole thing. How on earth are we going to find any hope in that, right? It seems just unremittingly bleak. And, and again, you know, I don't want to lie to you about how depressing this poem is. It really is a sad one. Um, but okay, what, what on earth is going on here? First of all, I mentioned in the previous episode how passionate Eliot was about music and how much he thought poetry should have a, a set of rhythms all its own. It's kind of its own sort of music. And he's such a master of that here. This, this small section is in three stanzas and they almost look, they even look like waves coming in and out at the shore, just gently lapping, right? And you can hear that in the, in the rhythms of it. Forgot the cry of gulls and the deep sea swell and the profit and loss. A current under sea picked his bones in whispers. So, you know, it's important, I think, to remember that even though Eliot has this reputation of being this incomprehensible modernist, he is a very, very beautiful writer. His poetry is very stirring as, as a kind of music. But what's going on? Okay, so Phoenicians, the Phoenicians were an ancient civilization in the Near East. They were in what is now Lebanon on the coast. And they were a seafaring people. They were known to the Greeks as kind of this far-off seafaring people, merchants. And that's why Phlebas the Phoenician has to forget the profit and loss, right? Because he has somehow been shipwrecked. We don't really know how, but probably he was on one of his merchant vessels, traveling, carrying goods. And that's the point of, of calling him a Phoenician and, and also the, you know, invoking him as this kind of ancient person from the ancient world. And he's at the bottom of the sea now. And Gentile or Jew, so no matter who you are, whether you're part of the Jewish tradition or part of some other tradition, you must consider that Phlebas was once as handsome and as tall as you. So this is a memento mori, a memorial of a reminder of death, right? The, the reminder that everybody's going to die. And how does that help us? Well, for one thing, right, it is equalizing. It means that you know, from Cleopatra all the way down to the poor typist in her little apartment, in her little flat, we are all, in some sense, doomed and destined to decay. So this experience that we're going through, that's, that experience is not unique. And it, the West itself is big enough to incorporate times of decadence. The West has gone through periods of decadence before, right? There have been times when the tradition has been lost or gone dark for many generations even, and then revitalized. You know, I think America, the Anglo-American Legal tradition and tradition of justice and, and political philosophy is an example of a revitalization of the West after a period when it had gone through a, another series of quite bloody wars. So, so this is, you know, this is not something new. So that's one thing that, you know, we can draw from this, this fourth section is that even, you know, that Philippus died, everybody dies. This, there is this kind of, you know, in, in experiencing our own mortality and coming face to face with it, we, we enter more fully into this life of connection with the past. We connect with the past by encountering our own mortality. It's not just a, something to get depressed about. It is also something to, to marvel at, that Phlebas was once as handsome and as tall as we. 
And this is part of a theme in the poem, which we haven't really explored yet, which is dead people and people under the sea. So we've mentioned that there's a reference uh, to Dante in the first section you know, I had not, I had not thought that death had undone so many. He says, so he's, he's looking out on this city of the walking dead, this London city of people who are dead, you know, dead while living, but also, you know, the ghosts of all these people that have died in the war. And one of the things he says early on that I think kind of gives us a clue to how to understand this fourth section, this again, this is a line that I didn't quote before, but I would like to quote it now. In section one, when he's talking about the unreal city he says, Unreal City, under the brown fog of a winter dawn, a crowd flowed over London Bridge, so many. I had not thought death had undone so many. And then on line 71, and this is part of this sort of mysterious and quite macabre dialogue that he does. He says, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year? And so we have all of these images of, of dead bodies under the earth, of, of drowned people. We have a repeating quote from Shakespeare's Tempest, those were pearls that were his eyes, which is again about a drowned man. And so this, this weird intuition that things which die and go under the earth will eventually sprout roots and grow and bloom. Now probably you can see what I'm getting at, right? That we, we have this sense in this poem of just grabbing all these different shards and fragments, this, these fragments we have shored against our ruin, right? That, that come from a broken and dead Western tradition. And I mentioned in the previous episode that in four quartets, there's this line, garlic and sapphires in the mud clot the bedded axle tree. And I think there is just a hint in this poem, if you read it carefully, that the dead fragments of the Western canon and the dead bodies of our ancestors, despite the fact that they are now just in the ground, fodder and buried fodder for worms and for soil, nevertheless, they will sprout roots and grow. And this messy, dirty kind of garlic and sapphires process of digging your fingers into stuff that you wish hadn't died, digging your fingers deep into the mulch of old dead stuff, gives you this slight inkling that one day, perhaps the dead shall rise, that one day there will be revitalization and renewal. So that's the first you know, kind of inkling of hope that I want to add to this rather somber episode, that not only do we see ourselves in relation to our ancestors and feel shame, but we also see ourselves in connection with our ancestors and feel hope. That's kind of how this, this poem, I think, works. And again, you know, somewhere in Eliot's psyche, there, were, there, there was the beginning of what would be his Christian conversion. And in his Christian conversion, he again found not a kind of smiley, everything is going to be okay sort of hope, but this sort of spare, detached hope of, of taking this bigger view, standing outside and, and, and peering into the heart of how, of how hope really works, right? It's this organic process of death and resurrection, of being reclaimed by the earth and then like growing back up, like, like sprouting roots, your, your own corpse sprouting roots, roots. It's very macabre, but it is also, I think, you know, in its weirdness, it's highly real and 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 highly meaningful. It's also, by the way, you know, just as a side note, I could give you a million different sort of statistics about the decline of marriage and fertility in the West and especially in America and, you know, how many fewer people are getting married, how many people are having kids out of wedlock, all of this stuff. Look, you know, I, I work at a wonderful conservative think tank and so I know I read those statistics all the time. And, and, they're important and they, they tell us something about the state we're in, but nothing, nothing can convey to you why that is a tragic thing. The way that this poem can convey that tragedy by seeing its way into the life of that typist in her apartment, right? This, this drab apartment where she's waiting for this loveless affair, right? That captures something about us and about the way that we are living now that needs grappling with. And so the reason that, again, I'm, I'm belaboring this, I'm dwelling on this, is that if you can reckon with that, that this kind of encapsulated, the, you know, the, a poem is like nothing else for encapsulating a kind of emotional mood, right? And if you can, if you can take that pill of kind of drab 
sadness. You can also follow Eliot through his kind of weird process toward hope, the hope that the corpses will sprout roots and bloom. And so we have this tremendous sense of longing and mourning of these cities falling to the earth, Jerusalem, Athens, Alexandria, all of them crumbling, right? And yet at the same time, we have this, this unknown third person, right? We don't know who you and I are exactly, but it's the speaker of the poem and somebody else, right? You and I walking together, but there is a third person that I cannot see. And in his notes, Eliot refers us to a couple different things to kind of understand what he means here. The first one that I'll talk about is a report from the great explorer Shackleton Bailey. And he's reporting, you know, this was, this was a man who, whose sort of reports of his own exploration were tremendously popular in Eliot's day. The first thing which I'll just mention here is this, this report from Sir Ernest Shackleton, who was a great explorer, and his reports of his voyages in the Antarctic were sort of widely published and read in Eliot's day. And he has this little passage, which is again in this Norton Critical Edition. Shackleton says, when I look back at those days, I have no doubt that Providence guided us, not only across those snowfields, but across the storm-white sea that separated Elephant Island from our landing place on South Georgia. I know that during that long and racking march of 36 hours over the unnamed mountains and glaciers of South Georgia, it seemed to me that often we were four, not three. I said nothing to my companions on the point, but afterwards Worsley told me, boss, I had a curious feeling on the march that there was another person with us. So this remarkable, this true report of, of Shackleton's voyage in the Antarctic, where, you know, in, in walking across just miles of frozen tundra, sort of undifferentiated white snow and ice, and they felt as if, this little party of three felt as if somebody else was walking with them, and they could never quite say, but, you know, Shackleton chalks it up to Providence with a capital P, right? This notion that, that God and Jesus is walking right there beside them. And so, so Eliot here kind of makes reference to that and also to the Road to Emmaus story. And, you know, again, those of you who have not maybe spent a lot of time with the Bible, this is a story in the Gospels after Jesus has been crucified and resurrected. His disciples still don't really know what's going on, that his friends are still sort of without a clue what's, what's happened. And they don't grasp that, you know, Jesus is risen. So they are tremendously, they're in tremendous despair. They feel like he's, he's just been cut off like a flower of the field, right? Just cut short and, and killed. And so this is this moment, the road to Emmaus is Luke 24. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village. Two of the disciples went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that, while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, what manner of communication are these that ye have to one another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he, that is Jesus, said unto them, Which things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but they saw him not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. <laughs> 
And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? I've said this before on this podcast, but if you are not a Christian, if you're not religious, that's really not what I'm here to kind of beat you over the head with. But I am here to say that this is an example of the tremendous fertility of the biblical tradition in the West. That Eliot, look, I don't even know, you know, what Eliot believed at this point. I don't think we know, you know, where he was in his, what would eventually become his journey to conversion to Christianity. And forcing that upon him too early, right? Trying to claim him for some, you know, Christian apologetics before he's even converted himself is a mistaken endeavor, right? We have to read this poem on its own terms. I do not want to say to you that there is this kind of, you know, this proto-Christianity in this, in this poem. What I do want to say is that Eliot has an inkling here that his sense of death in the West is not the final word, that the corpses are going to sprout roots, that the fragments in the dirt contain sapphires and that the mud will sprout trees again. And he expresses this in this image from the road to Emmaus of Jesus walking beside you before you even know it's Jesus and before you know who he is, and before you know that he's resurrected. It is all the hope that is right there next to you that you cannot yet see. And that's in this poem too. <laughs> right? That's here. It's not just, it's not just despair. It's not just emptiness, right? There, there is in here this inkling that for just a moment, if you turn and just out of the corner of your eye, you can see something that if you turn for one moment, you will recognize that this is not the end of the story. And I think that's what I want us to have from this poem right now in this moment, right? There is so much there's so much despair out there. I see it all the time. I hear it all the time. And I feel it too, you know? I look out and I feel as if our society is basically just tearing itself to shreds from the inside out. And again, obviously I'm a conservative. Obviously I'm a Christian. That's how I, you know, view and understand this. That's my very particular view on how this whole thing is going. But just beyond that, right, the, the tremendous sadness of watching people destroy themselves and riot and loot and, and you know, take their birthright, their all their inheritance, because each one of those people out there, right, is an inheritor of the West, even if they, they obviously don't know it, right? But each one of those people looting stores is somebody to whom the West belongs. And the sadness of watching them just rip it apart, it gets to my heart too. That's why I chose to do this long thing on the wasteland, right? Because Elliot more than anybody else, sees the West torn to shreds at his very feet, right? He sees the West after, you know, its greatest moment of self-harm, its greatest moment of just, you know, tearing itself apart. And he says, okay, what's here, right? Let's be honest, what's here? Fragments, emptiness, drabness. But the recollection that it was not always this way and will not always be this way way, right? That part of the West is dying and being born again, is losing yourself and, and coming back to yourself. Even if at this moment, all you can sort of get is just a glimmer of that idea that that exists. That's enough. It's going to be enough. That concludes our two-part examination of The Wasteland. It is a tremendous poem. It's very short. You can read it once and just enjoy the, the sounds, as I've said before, and then sort of get more deeply into understanding what it all means. But hopefully this has been a helpful guide and something to take away with you as you go forward to fight the good fight for the West. Okay, the mailbag. Again, thank you for the amazing mailbag questions. There are so many of them. I'm trying to get to as many of them as I can. My favorite one that I got today for this episode was this. You know, somebody said, hey, I've actually been inspired to go away and read philosophy and the great works of Western philosophy. And I'm having trouble. <laughs> it's hard, right? And like, I totally am, I'm there with you. You know, I, like I get that. And we've all, I think, had that experience, especially the first time you crack open something like this. People feel intimidated, I think, by the stuff that we talk about on this show. It's like, you know, it's great that, that it's great to talk about it here, but then you go away and you should feel like, you know, this, this isn't for me. This doesn't belong to me because it's too big. It's too important. It's too, you know, complex. It's too whatever. And I get that. I really get that. You know, like I, 
I think everybody, even the people that have fancy degrees like I do, you know, everybody has that sense at some point of just coming up against minds so much greater than your own and feeling like, well, what's the point, you know, of even trying? What am I going to contribute? You know, I think the first thing that I said that, can, you know, this person is asking basically, how do I, how do I read philosophy? How do I read like Plato? And I said this, I talked a little bit about this when we talked about C.S. Lewis, that the truly great authors are trying to make themselves understood. And I know that that's maybe a bit of a cop-out because there are great authors who are almost impenetrable, right? German philosophy, especially Hegel is a good example of somebody that, you know, tremendously worthwhile, but not easy to penetrate. And Plato at least is not like that, I don't think, because he is narrative and he contains a bunch of sort of interesting drama. But you have to kind of think about, you know, what is this person, you know, why did this person set out to write this thing? Why did this person, you know, sit down to put this on paper. I argued when we talked about the symposium that for Plato, it's a lot about retaining some element of the relationship he had with Socrates. So that's my first tip, I think, is before you set about trying to, you know, argue out the big ideas, what exactly is it that that Plato is is doing and saying about, you know, this ontological proposition or this metaphysical truth, whatever. Before you do any of that, just sort of say, you know, what is this dialogue trying to convey to me about the felt and experienced reality of the world? And then from there, you kind of move on to what I would call the sort of Aristotelian way of thinking about these things, which is like, okay, so within that, what is, you know, can I write out in, in as simple possible terms, like, what are the major points of this dialogue? If this, then that. If, you know, if love is everywhere, if love, if love is animating the whole universe, then we can go from our love of individual people all the way up to a love of the divine and of perfection, right? That's, you know, if, if you have to just like boil down the symposium and then go back and read it again, that's the other thing, right? You have to read this stuff multiple times and there is no shame in reading it through one time without feeling like you're going to get it, right? Nobody gets it all in the first try. And also you know, nobody is out, anybody who is out there telling you that they, you know, grasp this stuff easily is lying to you. Like, it's not as if everybody has, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be warm and fluffy and say, you know, everybody can understand philosophy equally. You know, there are people who are gifted in this and people who are not, but there is stuff, in, you know, the, the great works of Western literature have something that is of, of core and tremendous value to actual human beings, to every actual human being in the world. And so there's something in there for you. And the question is, what is that? And how can you kind of get at it? So my first recommendation is, you know, ditch all of your insecurity and just sort of say, all right, what does this book have to offer me? What am I getting out of it? And then step back from that and say, okay, and why did this, you know, what is this person trying generally to, you know, what's the major thing that this person is trying to convey to the world, regardless of me. So, so both that sense of kind of like, you're, you, you know, this stuff belongs to you. You are capable of, of reading it. Ask for help if you need, but you are capable of getting it, penetrating it. And then this sense of, you know, it, although it belongs to you, it is conveying some, you know, eternal or larger truth about the world, then, you know, you can go back and start to digest, I think, things a little bit more and return to things over and over again throughout your life. And, you, you know, sometimes you'll be walking down the street and you'll just think, oh my gosh, like that thing I read a year ago, suddenly that makes sense. And you go back to these books and, and, and try again. And that's all part of the process. We have this idea that you read this book once and that's it. That's your, that's your shot, right? If either you understand it or you don't understand it, like that is not what is happening. You crack a spine, you crack the spine of a book, for the first time, and you are entering into a lifelong relationship with that book. And there is a process that you can use to kind of help that first meeting be as smooth as possible, but that is not the end of how this, this sort of thing works. So that's my advice, is, is find what it's trying to give you, and then go away with it and let it sit. And if it doesn't work off the bat, it's not your fault. Go back and think about it and come back again. That concludes this episode of Young Heretics. It has been a pleasure, as always, to be with you. Thank you especially to the Claremont Institute, my wonderful employers who are so gracious in supporting me as I do this podcast. If you like this show, you will love The American Mind and The Claremont Review of Books, the two publications that we put out over there at Claremont. We always do accept donations. You can go to claremont.org slash donate or just click the donate button at the top of our main website homepage. 
tell them we sent you, mention that you found Claremont through Young Heretics, and enjoy. See you next week for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters. Bye.